You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hey, how you doing? Laney here, and thanks for checking out my show, Straight to Video. Today, I get to bring you a chat with film and documentary producer Gary Smart of Dead Mouse Productions and Cult Screenings UK. Now, if you're not familiar, Gary and Dead Mouse over the past few years have written and released some of the most definitive making of and retrospective looks into some of the most popular and iconic 80s horror and cult films. Kind of like a hot wire into my brain, too, with the likes of Return of the Living Dead the amazing Fright Night documentary and accompanying book, Your So-Called Brewster, through to the magnificent Lost in the Shadows, the story of the Lost Boys. And right now, the company have several projects in the works, including the much-anticipated RoboDoc, all about the classic film RoboCop, and they're working on a career-defining film about the life and work of Freddy Krueger himself, Robert England. And in the very near future, you'll get to see Pennywise, the story of It, which focuses on the iconic TV movie of the Stephen King novel starring Tim Curry, which I was lucky enough to get a sneak peek of recently. I had a great time chatting to Gary all about his introductions to horror, the various projects Dead Mouse are working on and what's involved to make them come to life. But this chat, it really focuses on the love, respect and relationship for the actor, the late Don Calfer, who starred in Return of the Living Dead, who Gary forged a unique relationship with very early on. And through this friendship, Don's influence really put Gary on the path he's on today. And it's a real treat to learn all about it. Before we speak to Gary, please show some support to our friends Dead Skull Coffee by picking up some of their amazing ground or full bean rock and roll coffee from their website deadskullcoffee.co.uk and if you add the promo code STV on checkout, you'll bag yourselves 15% off your order as a thank you for being a listener to this show. Okay, if you're a horror fan and particularly the classics from the 80s, you're going to get a lot out of this chat and be sure to follow everything that Dead Mouse and Cult Screenings are working on. All their previous projects and information can be found at Cult Screenings screenings.co.uk and look out for the new Pennywise documentary landing very soon. But right now, please enjoy my straight video chat with producer Gary Smart. Half down, wait, and all the partners. Push Dennis closer to the monster, please. And he takes a powder and jump. A little farther, Tim, find the light. All right, here we go. Yeah, thank you, and clear, please. It's amazing to me, all these years later, how people are still coming up and talking about that it has this lasting effect and impact. Its enduring power may come from the chords it strikes among all of us. We're all human beings and we were all children once. Pop culture has taken ownership of this miniseries. It scared the hell out of millions of people. Are you keeping all right? Yeah, just really busy at the moment because we obviously we're in post on the Robert England documentary. It's just every night we're working on it. It's just like manic at the moment, trying to get that kind of ready. You seem to be like juggling many projects all at once. Do like some get delayed, things on hold, and then another one picks up again, that kind of stuff. Just seems that like the last five years, the projects we've been doing, they've all kind of come to fruition now. <laughs> I think COVID kind of screwed us. And now suddenly, you know, we've got distribution on Robodot, distribution on Icon, now called Hollywood Dreams, and obviously Pennywise is coming out. Just things that all happen at once, which is a bit of a nightmare, but I'd rather it be happening now than not happening at all. Exactly, mate. Really appreciate you doing this with us. I'd love for some of the podcast listeners to find out more what Dead Mouse and Cult Screenings do, because I think a lot of them would really get off on it if they're not familiar with it. There's so much stuff out there these days. I could, like, go down a Facebook or just an internet rabbit hole and you find all these little companies doing all this cool stuff whether it be clothing stuff or people doing videos or anything you can just go forever really kind of like just the last couple of years it's just kind of like wild hasn't it in terms of you know t-shirt companies and pin badge companies and poster artists it just seems completely wild whereas five years ago there was like nobody doing it but it's brilliant because obviously you know especially as a collector myself get all these goodies now which you never have got before exactly I mean you're sat there surrounded by amazing stuff Imagine if that was accessible to you in like the late 80s, early 90s. There was hardly anything. I think America got some cool stuff, but us in the UK, we just got nothing. Well, we didn't have specialist shops here either, did we? And before the internet as well and eBay and stuff like that, we didn't have specialist areas to go to, especially where I was in Birmingham. There was like, there was no kind of like horror movie stores here. 
But obviously, thankfully, such change massively, we can get all this shit. What was the first one you remember? I mean, I'm from Nottingham, so I mean, we had one called Another World and an early version of Forbidden Planet. That's early 90s I'm going back to there. Yeah, we had a shop called, it's still there now in Birmingham, but it was called Nostalgia and Comics, and it was expensive stuff as well. It wasn't cheap. Yeah, that was the kind of first kind of like store, really, and then Forbidden Planet opened, and that's got bigger. But yeah, these conventions now are just brilliant because obviously you don't, you know, I used to go to NEC quite a lot as well, Birmingham Memorabilia, it was called back in the mid 90s, late 90s. So I used to go there and, you know, you could barely get Star Wars figures, you know, Mint on Card 1977 for like five quid back then you could. You were laughing. You could get autographed for five quid as well. I remember the uproar when Ray Park was charging like 10 quid, I think, for an autograph when Phantom Menace came out and people go mental. How dare he charge people? It's disgusting. You go to Con now, it's 100 odd quid sometimes for a photograph it's amazing how that kind of business has changed as well massively I think I got Ralph McQuarrie's autograph for five quid the guy who did all the original Star Wars paintings for George Lucas he was just sat there on his own no one around him I remember going to cons and you'd see some people like horror stars and nobody be around them and now you see the same people at cons and there's queues around the block that kind of culture has massively changed well you'll probably know like Robert England he was pretty much a regular for like 20 quid 25 pound then like in the last two and a half years he's like the main billing massive queue just don't even attempt to queue up for him because you're never going to meet him yeah that just shows obviously the interest now which has just massively grown you know and it's just been unbelievable it's great for us as fans but i've been to a con as a customer for a long time i think the last one i did was for the love of horror when they had all the lost boys people there and it was so busy. It's like, I'm going to get the autograph I need, then I'm out of here. The convention was great, but it was just mayhem. Yeah, it's a brilliant show. We did the Love of Horror when we, and we did a preview of Pennywise, only like 10 minute preview. And it was just after COVID. So it was still really tetchy, COVID was. And we walked in, and as much as I wanted to have a nose rasp, I like, I've just got to go on the stage, do it, and I'm going. Too many people, and it was obviously COVID. Nobody's wearing masks at all. Yeah, so I just got to shut out of their bed completely as fast as I could. So, yeah, I want to give people a bit of an overview on yourself and uh, Dead Mouse and cult screenings and all that kind of stuff. But just to kind of trace your introduction into horror and just films in general. You mentioned earlier you're from Birmingham. I think, was you born in 1982? Yes, it was my 40th birthday last week or the week before. I'm feeling it. Well, I've got a few years on you, mate, so don't worry about it. 40 is good. I'm feeling it at the moment. My back's aching, my legs are aching. Going grey. <laughs> Grey's in the beard. That's where I notice it, around right the side. I've had a really crappy beard because I had the ginger beard. You know, my hair's dark and now it's gone grey. It's like, you can't win. It was never the same colour as my head hair. It was always the wrong colour. So born in 82. So by the time you're like maybe six or seven years old, the video boom is in obviously in huge swing. Some of the most iconic 80s films have been released and still some more hitting cinemas. I mean, like Batman 89 must have been coming about when you were kind of conscious of everything. What are some of the earliest films you you remember watching on video i was allowed to watch horror at a very early age my granddad was a huge horror buff he used to rent videos out and then pirate the videos it's really weird he used to put them in his own cases but the case had a review from a newspaper clipping attached to it so i always remember being into horror because of him not on elm street 2 is probably the one i can earliest remember i would have watched stuff before then but i remember getting it for christmas and you know when you're a kid and you nose around for your Christmas presents beforehand and you, you know, go into the hiding places in the house. And I remember going to mum and dad's bedroom and they had like a wall unit and I rummaged through it. And in there was the VHS. Two VHS it was. It was Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. And it was the Amityville 2 to Possession. And that was my Christmas presents, probably the age of about six, seven, maybe. Yes, that's parenting done right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. But I knew I was into Freddy quite early because, I mean, again, for UK listeners, you go to nursery reception and you go to year one and year one, about five, aren't you? I think in year one. I remember in year one having a scrapbook with Freddy Krueger pictures in and taking it to school with me. So that was five, you know, maybe going up to six. So I knew who Freddie was and I loved Freddie and I went to Western Supermare and my mum got me a big door posters, the big life-size one. So kind of happened because my granddad, then it just kind of evolved really. And Freddie was always kind of the first thing really, followed by Return of the Living Dead. That was my horror kind of like schooling at first. I mean, that just went mental over the years. It just expanded and expanded. So when I say video shop, are you drawn back to a particular one? Is the one that jumps to mind? 
I live in a council estate in Birmingham. You know, you have like what we used to call the top shops, where in the middle of your estate there was a row of shops basically, and you have a fish and chip shop, and there was a Chinese takeaway, and there was a bookies. I'm sure, there's a dodgy little pub in the corner, but on the end of that was a VHS store, you know, a video rental store. And I just remember going into that store, and just obviously, you know, and when I think of Hellraiser, I always go back to there because I remember the standee of Pinhead being in there, and it was a really kind of like real dark, gloomy kind of little shop. It wasn't even that big, and I was just fixated on VHS cases. I, you know, I would love the art you know and that's why i think when you look at the artwork back in the 80s on videos and horror particularly you know the graham humphreys and people like that that's what draws your interest straight away so i just remember spending hours and hours just looking at vhs's and i remember being allowed to hire them as well even at a young age things were different then as you know and i remember going with my friend francis to go and hire pet cemetery and that would be what 89 that would have been 90 and we were allowed to go in as kids and rent it out because they knew francis's granddad and then obviously blockbusters you know i'd spend hours in blockbusters is it's weird now because when you've got Amazon, I've got Shudder, I've got Netflix, I've got Sky, and you can't find anything to watch. Back then, it was like, you didn't mind spending a long time like nosing at VHS covers. Now you just skim through and you're thinking, what can you watch now? So that's my memories of VHS stores. It's happy memories of VHS stores. Like you say, though, you're attracted by the covers. So I guess even like in the late 80s, early 90s, was you just kind of renting anything and everything, even if it was quite an old film? So that was kind of you getting a history of stuff throughout the 80s. My mum and dad were into videos as well because... I remember they always tell me the story, and I didn't believe it at first, that they, their first VHS recorder, or player, sorry, they bought the Hills of Eyes on video, cost them like £85 for a video, and I thought, oh, you're full of shit. And then years later, I found a magazine, a VHS magazine. We were doing research on what it actually was in one of our books, and it was a catalogue, and it had all to rent or buy, and they were that price, it was stupid prices. That tells what kind of paper they were. The first video they had was Hills of Eyes. So Grandad as well, and him obviously pirating films from the VHS store. I just had loads of different ones. I just remember so many different films. Obviously, I love films like, you know, Star Wars. And I love, you know, I like, loved Harry the Duck. I love Mass Universe, Roger Rabbit. But then it was horror as well for me. So it was things like Return of the Living Dead, huge, huge influence on me. The Romero films, Alligator. Oh, great one. I rewatched that not long ago. I did watch one and two recently, literally not long ago. Hellraiser was big for me. Hellraiser 2. I loved Ken Cranham as a kid. I'd seen him in TV shows. So I've seen him in Touch of Frost or I've seen him in something like Morse. Then seeing Ken in Hellraiser 2, kind of like, you know, I got obsessed with it. I mean, just so many. Wasn't a huge, huge fan of Friday the 13th. I don't know why. I, I like them now, but they didn't appeal to me too much. But I think I was more of a Freddy fan. You're kind of a bit spoiled if you get Freddy first, then you go to the others. You're right, yeah. And it's funny because we look at a documentary we've been working now about Robert and people talking about why Freddy's so popular and it's because you know he was, it's there it's his face it's a character he's not behind the mask you can see his features and you can see his personality so yes my horror film education was varied it's, it's grown over the years I mean I'm Chris Griffiths who's my business partner he's mad into kind of like you know kind of European horror and he's got me into quite a lot of that over the years just by suggesting things I like finding really cheesy horror films now ones I've never watched you know, the mutilator, chopping mall, where it's just cheesy fun. It's an hour and a half, some gore, but it always comes back to Freddy. It's always has to, doesn't it, Freddy Krueger? Was you a Fangoria fan too? Did you have access to Fangoria when you were a kid or was that pretty tough to hunt down? Yeah, not as a kid, no. So I probably started getting to Fangoria probably late 90s when it came a little bit more easier. Maybe when eBay started coming, was eBay about 2001 to 2000? Probably, yeah. I remember buying a load of Fangoria magazines from eBay, 20 quid for about, you know, 50 copies of Fangoria. You pay that for one now. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But no, as a kid, I knew of Fangoria because I'd seen things like Fangoria's Weekend of Horror, you know, and you saw it in films, the odd horror film, a copy of Fangoria would pop up, wouldn't it? It's interesting when you read some of them now of what could have been you know, these articles about upcoming films starring certain people, which never actually happened. You know, who could have been in what and you know what the sequel to Nightmare on Elm Street could have been as it was reported at the time. One thing that gets me is where you see all the adverts at the back for the T-shirts and the masks and it's like, oh, I wish I could still order those. There's got to be like boxes in a warehouse of like box fresh, unused yeah. stuff somewhere. It's got to be somewhere. I must have had some horror magazines because I remember the wall hangers, which I do now myself, wall hangers, but I remember the Freddy Krueger wall hanger. You know what that was from? They bought out a comic book series of Nightmare on Elm Street. It coincided with a Nightmare on Elm Street 6, Freddy's Dead. But you look at the adverts now, I saw one who was doing research for Return of the Living Dead. Somebody was selling the original half corpse from Return of the Living Dead, the prop. 
in the back of a Fangoria magazine in about 1989, I think it was, it was selling it. For like, like $100, something like it was. Oh, shit. <laughs> and one little quick story about stuff like that. It's completely off topic, but what I think about it, about horror. My biggest regret ever with horror and merchandise is in about 2001 2, somebody was selling a screen used Dr. Chenard overhead mask. And I remember yes. seeing this. I think, fucking, I really want it. I just started working, you know, you know, you're at college and you start working. I had a hundred quid on it's all I had. And I got outbid and it sold for about 112 quid to make it sold for. I've never seen anybody who bought that go, oh, you know, I've got the original Dr. Chenard. So it's probably decayed now, probably. But it's like, if I had an extra bit of money, and it was peanuts as well. And I always regret that. But I know I'm, I was like that then as well, because I think I would have tried to make eyes for it or a mouth for it. And I probably would have wrecked it. Melting it, trying to like glue stuff onto it and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would have done it. And I know I, would, I know I would have done it. I wouldn't have preserved it. I would have literally just kind of like, as you said, gluing a new mouth that I made out of plasticine on it. And I, so maybe it's a good thing I didn't get it, maybe, because it'd be in pieces now. We've put it out there, though, now. It's out there. It might come back. Yeah. If someone's got it, please get in touch. It'd just be nice to know what happened to it. It was back then as well. You, when you were on eBay, you were buying stuff from the UK. You weren't buying stuff from the States. It was all UK, UK, wasn't it? And you had to pay through postal order as well, if I remember. PayPal didn't exist. You wouldn't use your debit card or your credit card. So someone bought it on a postal order, probably, <laughs> in about 2002. So please, if you're out there, I want it now. Robocop would be a film you'd see when you're really young, like 10 years old, again, watching an 18 certificate film. Can you tell our listeners about you imitating certain scenes on screen, which you perhaps didn't fully understand at the time? I always remember going to my friend Ben Sparrow, his name was, going to his house and we watched Robocop and we bought, do you remember the old sherbet dips where you'd have the orange tube with the licorice? And I always remember this vivid memory of, of me and Ben putting the sherbet dip in a line on the table and snorting it because we saw it happen in the film with the bitches, you know, Bob Morton did it and we had no idea what cocaine was. You actually snorted it, you didn't pretend to do it. No, no, we snorted the sherbet dip. <laughs> I remember being really fizzy in my eyes, <laughs> but it was kind of like, you know, they say about films influencing kids, but I think definitely influenced us doing that. That's a really strong bit of memory I always, I always have. I always mention, I haven't seen Ben in years, but I always mention it on interviews because why we did the documentary on Robocop was because of the influence it had on children because it's a horror film, basically, I think it is. It's sci-fi, but it's horror because it's horrific what happens to Alex Murphy, but it's aimed at kids. It's not when it first came out, but after, it was aimed at children. So for us, it was a superhero film, really it was. I'm sure it was a trailer that says, you know, your next superhero and it's Robocop. You know, an 18th certificate film where someone gets massacred and there's lots of murder and mayhem. In probably like the most realistic and brutal way possible. It's freaking horrible. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Even now when I see it. Yeah, but that's why I say it's a horror. And people say, you know, why did you do Robocop? We'd done Leviathan, Harry's one, we did that, we did the Brewster one. And the reason why we did it, I genuinely still think, I think it's a horror film because it's horrific what happens to Alex Murphy. All the horror films we can mention, like Freddy and that kind of stuff. What happens to him is more horrific what happens to a lot of people in horror. You know, it's about a human being, you know, being destroyed, really. So, of course, there's sci-fi elements in it. But I'll argue that I don't think that Star Wars is particularly sci-fi. I think it's a drama. You have a spaceships in it, but it's not about the spaceship. Star Wars isn't it's about the people, about the family. Yeah, it's just an adventure fantasy thing, which yeah. I was never a big sci-fi fan. Everyone says, oh, you must like this sci-fi film. No, I just kind of like Star Wars because it's just this great adventure story. Yeah, me too, yeah. So, you know, that's a vivid memory I have on that. And I'm sure I've done other stuff. We used to play zombies when we were kids. So we used to have a tower block by us where I lived. It was like tig and tag, basically. You know, one person was a zombie and the rest of us were humans. It was Return of the Living Dead. We would play with characters. And what would happen is that person would have to chase us up and down this 14-story flat. If he'd grabbed your head, you became a zombie. And we were screaming our heads up. And people in the flats were coming out, having a go at us and screaming at us because we're making noise. And as kids, you don't give a shit, do you? You don't realise that somebody's house, they're living there, and you're disturbing their life. But again, we just loved it. And we'd imitate, you know, Return of the Living Dead as much as we could. And, you know, what are you doing today? We should play Return of the Living Dead. Yeah, we'll do that today. So horror has been so much about my childhood in so many different ways, from artwork to films to role play and collecting. 
trying to make Freddy costumes out of kind of like old jumpers and stuff like that and straws for fingers. So, yeah, massive influence. Now you can buy like a screen accurate thing just at the click of a button. It's amazing. It is amazing. <laughs> I mean, as you said earlier on, you know, as a kid, it was so hard to get anything for us. I mean, I love the Gremlins and to have a Gremlin, you know, like I've got one here, the Trick or Treat Studios, Life Size Gremlin. It's like, I would have loved that as a kid. I would literally, have drawn, you know, to have a Life Size Chucky in the house as a kid. Now I've got a Life Size Chucky, Michael Myers, Pennywise, got a life size Peter Vincent, I got a life size Freddy Krueger. It's like I would have been in heaven as a kid for that. Do you know what I mean? You've mentioned it a couple of times now. I think the first book I picked up from Dead Mouse was 245 Trioxin, in the story of Return of Living Dead. That's obviously a film that's very close to your heart and a lot led to the run-up of that book. But what's your original history and relationship with that film then, other than reacting it? When did you first see it and was you aware of like the loose connection between the George Romero movie, Night of the Living Dead, or was it just seeing the artwork and like, that looks fun? No, it wasn't even that. So what it was, it was one of my granddad's VHSs. He'd obviously copied it from the video store and it was in a black case and it had on the case, it had a film review right. and Return of the Living Dead and it was just sitting there yeah, he must have borrowed it to my dad. Again, I was allowed to put videos on, you know, videos were a big part of my youth. I had the video play in my bedroom quite young. And so this would have been probably, I reckon, about like 1990, maybe. So it would have been about eight. And I remember finding this picture, so I'm just putting it on. And my granddad hadn't recorded at the beginning. So it started at Bert just showing him around the warehouse. So there's about, about five minutes was missing, something like that. So I hadn't had the first five minutes for like years. I hadn't. I remember putting it on, just absolutely falling in love with it straight away and just loving the characters. And again, recognising people like Don, because my nan, she was always at our house, my nan was, and she loved things like Murder, She Wrote, Columbo. And I recognised this person from my nan's shows that she used to watch. Oh, wow. Don would pop up in everything in the 80s, you know, from Kojak to you know, Murder, She Wrote and whatnot, to Twin Peaks. So um, I remember recognising him and just becoming obsessed with the film, not having any idea of the connection between Russo and obviously Romero. It was some time after I'd watched Dawn of the Dead. Didn't like Night of the Living Dead as a kid, because again, I think when you're a kid and you watch black and white movies, sometimes it just seems really old doesn't it and, you, yeah, yeah. You know, and, you, and you're watching Return of Living Dead where there's like lots of gore and obviously Linnea Quiggy's got her boobs out and a bits out punk rock soundtrack blasting out as well yeah and then you put on Romero's Night of Living Dead it's black and white and it's kind of a bit depressing I just didn't connect with it I connected more with Dawn of the Dead and I loved Day of the Dead as a kid as well and then I remember weird story but my nan's sister died and because my nan's sister died we got given we were given money from my nan I don't know why you know, she gave us like 10 quid each, something like that, me and my sister. Maybe it was a cheer or stuff, I don't know. I remember going into Birmingham and they had a double box set in WH Smith's and it was Night of the Living Dead remake in a double box set with Return of the Living Dead. I had 10 quid and it was like 15. And mum being a tight arse, she would bite me. I remember saying I wanted it and, she, and mom's excuse was, can't have it because it's in widescreen. Our TV doesn't play widescreen, she'd say. And I believed that, you know, I was like, okay. She just didn't want to pay the extra five quid, probably knowing her. But then after that, she gave in and just bought it, mate. And I got the box set and I remember obviously watching Night of the Living Dead and then seeing the beginning of Return of the Dead, which I hadn't seen before, where you know, it says, you know, this is based on a true story. And believing it was a true story, actually believing it was a true story that zombies really existed. And you get all the bit, obviously, you know, we've obviously Jimmy Caron talking about Ramiro as well in the film. And then obviously, the, you know, the DVD came out in probably about 2002 or three, maybe. And then obviously my life got absorbed with Return of the Dead, obviously with Don and Beverly and the books and whatnot. That's how it started. It was, yeah, my granddad, really. I remember writing to Don. Was that your initial connection? Because we're talking about Don Calfrey, who played the character of Ernie in the film. It's, it's an iconic role. I mean, that whole film itself is just like comedy gold. The delivery of some of the lines are just fantastic, even to this day. Amazing film. Still is. It stands up so nice, the film does. They can never remake it. They can't. I know there's talk about it, but I just think it's silly them doing it. No, it was really because I, I got into a habit of maybe late 90s. When the internet first came out, or it was accessible and you could use it in school. So I was in sixth form. I used to stay back after school and use the internet. I'm going to find the website where it had celebrity addresses on. And I remember finding Don's. And I saw, and I thought I wrote to a few people and I wrote to Don. And about a year later, it came back not known at this address. And I was gutted. And I was absolutely gutted about it. Absolutely gutted. Anyway, then time went on as time does. And then MySpace came out way before, obviously, Facebook. You do a search on MySpace. And Beverly Randolph came up, played Tina in Return of Living Dead. And I just got, you know, connected to her as you do. And back, back then, I think people weren't connecting to horror stars online as they do now. I remember reaching out to Beverly 
and saying I'm a big fan of you know of Return of the Dead. I love Don Cowper. Do you ever speak to him still? And she messaged back going, oh, I see him all the time. You know, we're really close still. We've been friends for a long time. Do you want me to get in touch with him for you? I was like, oh, yes, please. Anyway, and then I was living at home at the time, and it was a Sunday evening, and the phone rang, and then mum answered it, and she came back. She went, there was a man on the phone. She says, I don't know who he is. I can't hear him very well, and he's got an American accent. Got on the phone, and it was Don Cowper. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, and Don was really weird, because even back then, Don was deaf as a doorpost, Don was. So most conversations with Don on the phone was Don talking, because he couldn't hear you. You know, you'd have to really shout. And I, being quite nervous anyway, I let him do the talking. So Don then phoned me, I reckon, for a year. Every single Sunday for a year, he phoned me. No way. Yeah, yeah. And it became just a friendship, really. And it was more, he phoned you, tell you about what films he'd watch, what he was having for his dinner, what he'd cooked that week. And it was weird. We never talked about Return of the Living Dead. We never talked about it. It was always about, you know, what I'd been up to at work. It was always interested in what you were doing. You know, how's work? How's your family? We talked to my mum sometimes on the phone. And then the NEC were doing memorabilia events, as we talked about earlier on. And they did a thing, there's a magazine called Gorzo. It was a really, really nice magazine. Then it became all tits and ass and, you know, it became all naked women on the front covers and what. I understand why it did that. I understand the mentality behind it. So I'm not criticising it. But at the time, it was really good mag. And I got friendly with a guy called Christian Sellers. And Christian said, you know, we're doing this event in Birmingham and Gore Zone are sponsoring it. And they're trying to get as many horror people as possible to their kind of area, their Gore Zone area. Do you think Don will be interested? And I said, yeah, and me being me, instead of going to Gorzon, I wrote directly to Memorabilia. And a guy called Phil, can't remember his surname now, he was a really nice chap. He was basically running Memorabilia in Birmingham. Anyway, he basically said, yeah, we'll get Don over, we'll pay for his flights, pay for his hotel. I'm thinking, shit, I had to organise that. I was only probably, would have been early 20s maybe. You know, not really not experienced in this area. Exactly, yeah. Having to organise flights and accommodation and then scheduling for Don to come over. Had he done any conventions in America or anything like that? He'd done conventions in the States and he'd been to the UK because he was really close friends with Donald Pleasance. He did a film in the 70s with Donald called The Rainbow Boys. Don was really young, but Don became really close to him. The last time Don came to the UK was 95 for Donald's funeral. He'd been to conventions in the States, had never done a convention here. So he was really excited for it, really, really excited. Anyway, Don came over and he spent time at my house and with my parents and my sister. And How was it to meet him for that first time? Was it cool after you'd held all those conversations? I think because we'd already had a, like a year friendship, cool to meet him in the flesh. Skype or Zoom didn't exist. It was just a phone call, you know, traditional. I wouldn't even phone your mobile because it would be too expensive. Did you pick him up from the airport? I picked him up from the airport. Me and my now business partner, Adam, picked him up from the airport. It was really exciting to meet him. We went for a Chinese because he came quite late in the evening. It was really weird because instant kind of friendship. And it's very strange when you're 25 and there's a 60-year-old man. But he wasn't a 60-year-old man in his head. He was a kid. He never grew up, I think. You know, he had a really kind of great sense of humour. He was really energetic. And he was losing, obviously, he'd lost his hearing to a degree, he had the hearing aids. But he didn't see himself as old. And he, I think he liked being around young people. So he got really attached to me and Adam. We well, called him like an uncle. It sounds really cliche, but he became like family. He genuinely did. He was a family member. We spent two weeks here. And then the year after, we went and stayed with him in Palm Springs. Uh, Yucca Valley, sorry. Showed us around LA, took us, you know, to Mexico for the day. <laughs> he had to go and get his hearing aids done in Mexico. And he took us there. He took us to the worst part of Mexico you can ever imagine. It was like shanty town, like El Paso. I thought I was going to get murdered. <laughs> or Don leaves us in the car. So funny, when we was driving back, we went to this little restaurant. And the guy recognised him straight away from Weekend at Bernie's. And you can see people still recognised him from the films he was in. So we came really friendly with him and, you know, that led on into the book because Donna shared those stories with me. And I said to Christian, you know, do you fans doing a book on Return of the Living Dead? I knew the cast was still friendly and, you know, obviously I became friendly with Beverly, Tom Matthews and Miguel and people like that. When we went over to the States, Don introduced people in the flesh. So the book came kind of easy, really, to be honest, but we had got a publishing deal with the UK company. There's lots of problems after with them, you know. The book wasn't handled as well as I think it should have been. It was a great book and people loved it, but it wasn't really promoted as much as it should have been. And, you know, it, there was nothing really in the local, in like British magazines about it. And it wasn't really podcast back then, of course, it wasn't. But even like Starburst and, you know, and Fangori, that weren't, no one was covering it at all. And it was released worldwide. It's just like on all five films. I mean, people hate four and five, but it was still about what went wrong with those films. Because Don was supposed to be in, in number four and five. Don was supposed to be number three. Don was supposed to be number two. And other people, 
think with her to come back. So it's a really interesting story, I think. We, you know, we didn't make any money off that, and it was released. And then I was asked then not long after to write the documentary More Brains, A Return to the Living Dead. And that was from the guys that made Never Sleep Again, that made Crystal Lake Memories, Tommy Hutz and Mikey Perez. And because we had done the book, I think it was just easy for them to hire us, a couple of Brits who already knew the franchise quite well, knew cast and crew, knew the structure of the doc. And it was really easy for us, that was. I'm not just saying it was easy because we, we would just done the book. We kind of did the work in about a week. Naively now, it does not take a week to do a documentary, it doesn't. <laughs> I've learned that hard way. But what it did show me how to structure documentaries and how you use the transcribe from the interviews, which are all typed up, and you then structure it into an, we call it a script edit. So basically, instead of editing on the computer, you edit on script and you create the documentary on paper. It taught me how to do that, really. And it also taught me how narrative works in documentaries. Now, you can use maybe an answer from another question earlier on. And also, actually, what you read on paper and you think is really interesting crap when you watch the interview because the delivery of the person isn't as, as energetic as you think it's going to be it's quite mumbling you know what I mean so it was a really good learning curve and that resulted in us doing obviously you know the other documentaries so Return of Dead's got a massive place in my life really because it made me meet Dom and become friendly with Don obviously unfortunately Don passed away in 2016 Don opened doors for us he genuinely did it was Don that encouraged us to do film as well you know we did ditties and stuff like that don encouraged us because i think he saw something in us and he was always on the phone you know you need to do this why don't you try your hand at that so i genuinely think if i didn't meet him and beverly we wouldn't have done all what we've done we just wouldn't have i wouldn't have met chris i wouldn't have then done the screenings i wouldn't have then done our razor documentary which led on to meeting brian cox obviously who helped us as well in the early days that led on obviously to bruce and he went on and on and on that came from don genuinely did and that came from watching that vhs back in 1989 90 whatever it was which my granddad had nicked or pirated everything happens for a reason i think yeah that was a definite like crossroads moment things could have just turned out totally different that's why i'm very precious on return of living dead because lots happening with the franchise at the moment i kind of i'm very precious on it in a weird way because it sounds really stupid now because it's everybody's but back in the day no one really cared about it it was very very cool tell people what my favorite film was and even have a clue what i was talking about and obviously that because obviously i was uk based big in europe because obviously the punk rock but it felt like it was mine in a weird way and now there's so much out there return of the dead in the last couple of years i think it's lost its cult thing now because it's everywhere it is t-shirts and there's action figures coming out and there's hats and there's costumes and there's latex masks there's fucking tarm and sauces and you know what i mean it's kind of lost what it was for a long time it was a cult really niche kind of film it's catch too because it's great everybody's seeing it people love it now most people probably wouldn't admit to it I think people do like it maybe more so than some of the Romero's probably do it's just got so much heart to it yeah it has yeah you know this is 1985 and you've got a story based around a group of punks but also the adults the adults aren't the bastards in it the adults aren't the baddies and you've got three old men basically yeah you know <laughs> And they're the heroes, old, you know, in their 50s, maybe, but they're still old for a 1985 film. Yeah. Those guys were literally the heroes of the film. You know, they pulled it together. They saved, no one saved the day, but they tried to. You didn't see that at all. You didn't. It was either some bird running around with the boobs out. We get that as well. Bonus. <laughs> yeah, you get that. But that, that juxtaposition, of, you've got on one hand, these punks who are outrageous. On the other hand, you've got these level-headed people. I know that Jimmy Caron's kind of a bit, he's whining, he, he's an irritant. But then his heart then, because when he dies, before he dies, he apologises to Freddie, played by Tom Matthews, and, was, and then he puts his ring on the crematorium and says, ask for forgiveness. So all that kind of like bravado and bullshit. There's a man who's broken. Again, that being written in 1985 by O'Bannon. Fuck and then all the subcontext, you know, about is Ernie a Nazi or not, you know, and his name's Ernie Colton Brunner, which is a name after a famous Nazi he's got Eva Braun on a poster behind him which obviously is Hitler's wife the original concept art had gold teeth and spectacles in the loft you know in the attic you know, even like the Luger he carries around which is a German and he speaks German in it you know he's trained like a bunch of drunken soldiers he says when obviously looking at the rain that little sub context came into it and would you have noticed that in 85 going to the cinema? No, it's probably like a Freddy's Revenge thing where no one realised back in the day. Oh, yeah. That's a whole nother thing. You know what? I watched it last night, Freddy's Revenge. It's so funny. I've been watching Nightmare on Elm Street films, obviously because of Dean's Robert Doc. And I love Nightmare on Elm Street too. And I watched it last night and I thought, how the fuck did no one know? That first time he screams, 
Clue Gulliger is playing his dad and he's downstairs and he has a nightmare upstairs. He screams. It's like a, a little girl screaming upstairs. So like, how did nobody know? But again, you wouldn't. I think things were innocent anyway there. Watching a film back in 85, you're watching it once. You're not revisiting it over and over like we do now. And I can sit there and break down a movie and pause it and zoom in and screen grab the shit out of it. And you can then speak to the people that made it and they tell you what they meant. That's what I do in these docs as well because you're sharing stories which people don't know. And also the effort goes into making a film. We've done our Dark D series. And we put loads of stuff in there, little Easter eggs around and people don't even notice them. That always fascinates me how much work which you perhaps know is not going to get seen, but perhaps by just a, a minute amount of people. It's amazing the effort people go to because it's hard, you know, on our very, very low, low independent level. That's stressful enough. But the fact that people make the effort to put these little things in. For the fan service, a lot of it is, you know, look at Term of Living Dead and you've got the, the eye chart on the wall, you know, and it says, Bert is a real slave driver and a cheap son of a bitch who's got you and me here. Now, you wouldn't have seen that in 1985. It would have been... Well, not on a VHS. Or even the flicks. It would have been so grainy, it would have been. So like now, people zoom in, know what it says, and there's always a debate what the last couple of lines say. But I've got on good authority, it is. Bert is a real slave driver and cheap son of a bitch who's got you and me here. That's what I've been told from valuable sources. But people still contradict what it says at the end. Return of the Living Dead just set you guys on this path for Dead Mouse and Court Screenings. You went on to do the Hellraiser stuff. I think you have like a hot wire into my brain with the projects you take on, particularly like yeah. Fright Night with your so-called Brewster and you release the Lost in the Shadows book. So it's either like a documentary or a book. If nobody's seen either, they need to check them out because everything is incredible. Your passion really shines through. The end product is always top draw of the highest quality which I think shows that you're fans as well and you know it'll be appreciated but I'm always fascinated in what's involved in these projects from like a copyright or licensing point of view is there a lot of hoops to jump through like can you strip it down to its most simple terms for us back in the day it was easier Hellraiser and Brewster was very simple really and that, that may be simple in a naive way maybe for us not doing things right maybe okay. <laughs> you know fair use was a really strong term back in the day because as long as you were not damaging somebody's intellectual property we're doing a documentary on Friday night saying it's a shit film we're damaging the film there the studio would have to prove your documentary was damaging their product now you, you're doing a celebration of your old cast and crew back it's very very hard to prove they're damaging their product and also they're not doing anything with it so that was a bit easy but also fair use was easy as well because as long as you were contextual and narrative and educational you could use images and you could use footage i'm talking to you now about freddy krueger stretching his arms out running down the alleyway in a not around Arm street i could legally show that clip because it's narrative because i'm discussing that clip so that was quite easy that event now it's not and this is not a criticism of anybody, but because documentaries have come out over the last few years, which have been very profitable on Kickstarter, stuff like that, you know, some of these quite big horror focus retrospectives on numerous films and a particular decade, they've raised half a million quid on Kickstarters. It's started making people start thinking now there's, there's money in this. And I will say, you know, quite clearly, we take a long time because we don't make any money. We don't actually take a salary at all. That will have to change one day because I'm skint because of them. You know, I'm literally, you know, we invest our own personal money in the projects as well as obviously Kickstarters. But anyway, going back to what I was saying about copyright. So it's kind of changed a little bit. So on Pennywise, we had to do fair use legally and we had to have a fair use lawyer and we had to have an insurance certificate as well. So when we did the first cut of Pennywise and it went to the lawyers and obviously, you know, we license images, we pay for images as well and we get a lot off the cast and crew. If it's their own images are taken, obviously that's obviously can go in because all we need off them is a signed agreement it doesn't affect the studio in any way but if we're showing clips and promotional stills from a film we have to make sure it has narrative and contextual it can't be creative it can't be we just show a picture of Pennywise to make our documentary look nicer it's got to be narrative so we sent off the fair use logs basically what you have to do is you have to literally time code every part of your doc two hour documentaries time coded with every clip so Tim Curry appears at 1 minute 20 seconds to 1 minute 40 and then the image maybe a Pennywise appears who it's come from is it fair use have you got a license for it you have to do that for everything so we got this document sent over to the lawyers and let's just say there's probably a thousand lines on that Excel document and probably 500 images used and clips from Pennywise clips from other films obviously you know where cast and crew have been connected to that came back from my lawyers and I reckon 60% of it was red 
saying basically can't use it. Holy shit. Yeah. And what happens then is if you want to argue the lawyers, because obviously they are gods, you know, you're talking anything from $500, $650 per hour to argue. So we had to be very, very creative and go back and actually spend some money on licensing, look at what we could be more creative. But actually on Pennywise, I think it helped the project because it made us more creative with the behind the scenes footage we had right. and the behind the scenes photographs. So it's a very, very complicated process. We we're having to go through Robocop next and also Icon, which is the Robert England story, Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares. That should be easy because it's spread across like 25, 30 films he's been in. It's very much about contextual because it's about obviously an actor's career. I think Robocop would be okay as well because we've got loads of stuff obviously from archives from people. But also what's unique about Robodoc is that it's not a traditional documentary like Pennywise is. It's a dissection of every single scene in the film. No way. That's why it's four hours long. So you get how the film was, you know, concepted, but you go straight into the movie then. And you literally get at least two or three people from every single scene talking about that scene in detail, how the effects were created, what the costuming was, how the particular actor was cast and who was meant to be in it instead of them. Unreal, man. Yeah, so it's very much a dissection. So that is very much an educational piece in terms of obviously, you know, the concept of the doc. How close is RoboDoc now? We're just about to sign a distribution deal. We've been negotiating a contract for about six months and that is literally going to be signed, I reckon, in about a week. So... It depends how fast that distributor will announce and say, you know, it's four hours long and it's a limited series. That's on part one only. Part two will be next year and part three the year after. So, yes, the rubber up is coming, you know. It, the announcement, I don't know what will come first announcement-wise between that and Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares. Again, like spinning plates, you got them all coming all at once. <laughs> I was saying to you earlier on, it's really weird for us because we we're on a trajectory with Leviathan and Brewster. So we made Leviathan, we funded it ourselves most of it. We raised five grand, I think we raised on Kickstarter, but we rest it we paid ourselves for. That came out, but where that was coming out, we were starting pre-production on Brewster. So the sales of Leviathan, the DVD sales, that money went straight into Brewster then. So we raised, I think, 18 grand. It wasn't a lot considering for Brewster. And we put, I think we put about 30 grand in ourselves. Again, the direction was quite nice. It was the year after it came out. Basically, a year to pre film and post and release that was quite a nice little path we were on really. that was our, always our plan then Roblox came along and screwed it all up for us so Roblox comes along and we raised 30 grand I think 28 grand on Kickstarter and we put every penny of Brewster went into it so in the end we put probably about 90 grand of our own money into it so when people criticise us on you know you took 33 grand ran off we put 90 grand of our own money into that as well 30 grand was brilliant and obviously we, you know, we needed that but that project is over 100 grand you know it's 120 well, it's more than that now. I think it's probably about 200 grand. I think that project is now. The problem with that was Robocop was blue and blue, got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it went from one film to all three films, a comic book series, the TV series, video games. And the original plan was to interview 20 people. That ended up being 100 people. That ended up being 100. Yeah, 100 people in Robodoc. The problem with that happened then is when we did Pennywise, which was the plan to do, and we'd already scheduled it, that was a big enough project, Pennywise, because that was 45 people interviewed. That then kind of like bashed into Pennywise. And we were shooting Pennywise in Canada and still filming Robodoc interviews in Canada. You've got the Robert Englund one. Uh, I mean, how is that for you being like such a Nightmare on Elm Street fan to get to sit down with him? Because he's such a character himself. He is, yeah. I've never met him at a convention. It's really weird. When we started doing a doc, I started going to conventions as a paying customer because we were going anyway. We were being invited to stuff to do screens, stuff like that. And we were being invited to the Weekend of Horror in Germany. And we're in the back room with, you know, Jeffrey Combs and bloody God knows what, and just chilling with them. David Warner, who passed away recently, chatting to him for two days was an amazing experience so i never met robert but again robert is up there for me you know as, as an icon like everybody else who loves horror so we were trying to get hold of robert and then robert's really hard to get you can imagine people after robert all the time people are always trying to get in so we were told that the only way to get to robert is through nancy his wife nancy's kind of a gatekeeper for robert she runs the website even though he's got a manager she's the one that vets people first so Mikey Perez, who works with us on Robocop and worked with us on Pennywise, he'd also obviously co-produced Never Sleep Again documentary. So he knew Robert through there and Nancy. So he gave me Nancy's email address. Now, at the same time, we'd gone to Germany. We'd been invited back to Germany again. And Robert was there. And I just chickened out, really. You know, he was around the block, absolutely around the block. 
for two days. We stayed in the same hotel as him. And the first night we went to the bar and he was there and he had a load, you know, he had a load of people around him. Master of ceremonies, they were probably conducting it. He was literally. And we had him on one side. We had Steve Zagal on the other side. Well, it was fucking weird. He wasn't a nice person. But anyway, so it was just really weird. I couldn't feel comfortable. And the next night we left early. We had to go at a certain time off the our ferry. Mikey went, we're going out for a meal tonight with Robert. I've got you, you know, an invitation to come as well. Fucking, I can't come. I'm going to go home. And he said, no, you know, great opportunity to meet him. You know, you've been invited. Um, we just couldn't do it. You know, with three of us were going back to the UK and I was fucking gutted. And then what happened was we were delayed at Calais for like six hours. Oh, shit. So we could have gone. So I was really, really upset about it. It's missed opportunity. And then uh, an email come through from Nancy. I'd already written to Nancy a few weeks before. It was weeks and weeks before actually it was. Came out the balloon. She went, oh, Robert, would like to talk to you. Are you available on Sunday, 7 o'clock UK time? Yeah, of course. Shitting myself. And then he phones, you know, that Sunday night came and he phoned, he fair paid to him, the phone rang and it was Robert England. And it was the same experience I had with Don. It was really strange because he was just talking about other shit. He was talking about where he'd been and what, and it was not about Freddie. And then we got into the documentary man, and he said, listen, I'll let you do it if you promise you'll talk about other stuff from Freddie Krueger because I never sleep with the game's been dumb. I know Freddie's important. I know he is. I know he's important to the documentary from a marketing point of view, but there's no point in me doing it if you're not going to talk about everything else. I went, you know, I said, let me pitch what my idea is. And I pitched him. It's about the man behind the mask. It's the man behind the glove. It's about his character actor who started in theatre, who started off playing roles like the sidekick and the comedic roles. Then ended up then, you know, in V, become an international name because of V, playing Willie, the really friendly alien. And then by default ends up as Freddy Krueger. And then becomes a Hollywood horror icon, a rock star. But what happens then to that career? Is that role a gift or a curse? Has it actually damaged him? And then I said, but I think not damaged you. What it's done, made you into this icon, made you into the same as Bela Lugosi, Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing. So yeah, it might have damaged maybe you getting an Oscar or getting, you know, a BAFTA. But what it's done, it's cemented you in history as his character. And this doc is now, is for people to go, I didn't know Robert was in that. Oh God, Robert was in this. Robert started with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 1970s and Stay Hungry and Jeff Bridges. What? Robert was in Galaxy of Terror. Robert was in Buster and Billy and played a, an albino. That's what we're trying to do with the doc. We sold it to Robert and he said, I'm in London in March. I want you to come to London and have a meal with me. And Nancy, do not worry about money. I will pay for you, your meal. Fair play. Get an email off Nancy. We're in London. She would like to come down to this hotel. So we got there. It's me and Adam went. And it was again, it was really nerve wracking. I was shitting myself. And he comes down. He gives you a big hug. And he's talking about films and bullshit, you know. And he goes, oh, anything you want, you can have. He says on the menu. I know I'm not one of the people who just have the most expensive thing. I'll find the cheapest thing on the menu. If it was dear, and he said it was fucking really dear. It was. It was ridiculous. And I found a little a lamb, and it was like 48 quid for some oh lamb. Oh, my God. But it was the cheapest thing on the menu. And I went, I'll have the lamb. And he went, you sure? I went, yeah. He went, do you want anything else? I said, no, the lamb's fine. Do you want a drink? I went, oh, no, no. And I said, oh, I'll buy a bottle of wine. We'll share the wine. This lamb comes out, and it's the smallest bit of lamb. I mean, literally, it's like a fucking tea coaster. And there was nothing else with it. I hadn't realised you had to order your veg separately. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Places I go, you bought a lamb, you get your bloody, you know, it's a totally carvery, you know, you get everything with it. And he said, you sure you don't think? I said, no, no, I'm like, I was fucking starving. And we snuck out after and ranted five guys. But he just sat there for like two hours, just chatting about film. And again, not Freddy related. It was all about everything else. And then we kind of, you know, we arranged to go to the States, go to his house, and we interviewed him. And obviously, Nancy's been brilliant. I've interviewed him three times, twice in the UK, once in, in the States. So it's a weird experience with Robert. I'm not as close to Robert as I am with, I suppose, with Dom. I don't think I'd ever be anywhere with anybody else because he treated us like family. We paid for Don's cremation, you know, because the family, you know, weren't struggling per se, but we wanted to help. So we paid for that, you know, and that wasn't because of showing off. and that. It was, We were that close to him. We wanted to help with that. No other reason than, than that. And obviously then when we did the book, The Revenge of a Living Dead comic book, that was Don's story. Don always wanted it told. That kind of was full circle for me with Don. You know, we tried to do a documentary on him and no one was interested. It was fucking irritating me. No one cared. Yet when it was announced he died, it was everywhere. I mean, it was like E! Entertainment. It was like every major outlet Don care for character did. And I was thinking, when he was here, no one cared about the doc. It was going to be called That's a Cut, the story of Don Kaifer. Because you ever watched the film 10 with Dudley Moore? I know of the film. I don't think I've ever seen it. So he plays a neighbour in it. Sleazy kind of like guy with all birds. But he's always shagged, basically. There's a very really kind of cool picture of Don behind the scenes. And he's got this lean over woman with a leg spread. And he was doing the film and he had to go down on this girl. And then when he comes up, 
the director says that's a cut and Don looks down at her and goes no that's a cut as in you know so that's what the documentary is going to be called so we knew kind of the story behind that and we, we had loads of people to be interviewed you know we had some big directors and whatnot who wanted to come on board but when we put it out there when we were doing Kickstarters never ever again I think we raised about a grand no one cared and it's a shame but what really upset me with Don is I've got next to me here now I've got a box literally by my feet and it contains hundreds of photographs of Don as a kid Don was very humble Don lived in a retirement kind of caravan park kind of you want to call it in Yucca Valley you know, he didn't have a lot of money Don didn't you know despite obviously being in all these films he didn't have much and he was very humble anyway so when he passed away his estate was sold all the contents and I went on eBay and it came up at Don Kaya for personal photographs and I saw some of the images what they'd posted and they were intimate images Dom was around in the 60s. Dom would not have wanted them out and about, do you know what I mean? So I messaged the paper and went, listen, I said, you know, how much do you want for these pictures? And the game, it was quite expensive, but I've just paid it because I think they need to be with us more than anything. And yeah, and the idea was to put some pictures in a book. We're going to do a book. And I will do probably one day a photography book of Dom. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Just, you know, because he's got so many, it's a life of his character act, basically. But that's how much he meant to us, do you know what I mean? And it, I don't think I'll ever have that again with anybody else. I'm friendly with Ken Cranham, friendly with Brian Cox, you know, and he's gone on to you know, succession has gone through the roof now friendly obviously with Robert but I just don't think we'll ever have that connection with someone again that's lovely that it goes back so far for you as well yeah he's the start of it all and, and you know and he genuinely genuinely is without I don't know, repeat myself but without him none of it would have happened I just don't think someone from Birmingham from a council estate not pulling the heartstrings but you know, I'd never have dreamt that as a kid, never have dreamt of it. You know, and it's still weird today, you know, stuff that we do, where we've all come from. And you've got to come from somewhere, no, you have. But how one man who you watch in a film can influence you, but not directly in a way that just his influence and his encouragement. We didn't go do his documentary on Leviathan, do this on that. It was none of that. Just set the seeds and push you in certain directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always remember when Don came over to the UK for the first time and he did that convention I told you about earlier on. And I did some eight by tens for him. Got some screen grabs from the Terminal Living Dead and Weekend at Bernie's and whatnot. Got them professionally printed. I remember him sitting there and he's staring and phrasing. He's going, you've captured these scenes. You know, you've really got an eye for editing. You should really look at editing. And again, you know, there's a lot better editors than me out there. But that encouragement someone said to you, as a, like a nervous kid from Brom, and this Hollywood actors there who starred in films with Warren Beatty, co-starring parts with Warren Beatty, Jack Nicholson, De Niro, been in Scorsese films. And he's sitting there going, you've got something. And again, it's something I'll always remember. I'll never, never, ever forget Don. I won't. My house, I've got portraits of him around the house, you know, commissioned artwork we had done of him. I've got a brilliant picture in the hall. I love it. I never post it online. And it's, you know, old kind of photographs where you get multiple pictures on one kind of like proof sheet. And it's Don, probably early 70s, rolling a joint in his kitchen. And I've got that on um, the hallway and it's just printed large frame. It's just 20 images of Don just rolling the joint in the bathroom. I've got a poster from one of his first ever plays when he won an award back in like the 1960s as I'm in there. The hallway, we've got some portraits of him. I've got a bar in the garden and it's called Club Kaufer, named after him. The art is Jason Miller, who's brilliant. Did some artwork for me as, as a pub logo. So Don is instrumented around this house. He is, yeah. My mum and dad got pictures of him in their house. You know, they live in Spain and they got a picture of Don up on the wall because he was close to them. It's really strange, you know, how someone can come into your life for a very short period, actually, really, physically, you know, as a friend make such a lasting impression on you oh man that's incredible i'm gonna wrap it up gary i could go deep into every single project and i hope everyone's just gonna check them out i'll leave it on one thing and i'll put you on the spot you've obviously everything you do is a passion project but if you could pick any random 80s horror regardless of how well known they are or how successful the project would end up being from a fan point of view is the one you'd like to do lots have already been done haven't they the big players have already been done i would like to do one on and even though there's been quite a lot done in terms of bonus features, we were really close to reanimate at one stage. Went for lunch with Brian Yuzna about it. It just never happened because of all the other projects. It's a weird film, mate. It's one, two, and three, actually. But I don't know. I mean, Halloween's been done. Friday the 13th has been done. Not really, I'm sure it would have been brilliant, but it's been done. And there's, there's probably loads of obscure 80s horror, which would be great. Was you a fan of the Monster Squad documentary? Did you get to see that? Wolfman's Got Nards? I did see it, yeah. But again, it was really weird. I didn't connect with that film as a kid. I don't know why. So, Night of the Creeps, I didn't either. 
I appreciate them films now. I like and watch them now. I really enjoyed watching them as a molder. I don't know why. I think maybe I was so focused on Freddy, Return of the Living Dead, Michael Myers maybe, and then I was focused on Turtles and Mass Universe movie. So close to the documentary on Mass Universe, but obviously, you know, there's certain question marks over key personnel involved in that film. So that never happened, you know, and I'm obsessed with Batman, you know, the 89 Batman, with, you, know, you mentioned earlier, I'm obsessed with the Joker. I think that maybe pushed me away from like films like Monster Squad. I don't know why, you know, I didn't watch it. I love Tremors. My friend Nicholas Helmsley, who's the editor on Pennywise, he is obsessed with Tremors and he wants to do a doc on it, but can't think of any more docs at the moment. I want to get these ones done. Yeah, get everything finished, like six months off then. Right, what's well, got to be next? Gary, I've loved it, mate. Thank you ever so much. Good luck with Pennywise and obviously RoboDoc when it comes out. And everything else you're waking on. Brilliant, you're a star. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Most TV movies disappear into oblivion. I think the fact that it is consistently played on cable has opened it to a much wider audience. You say it, and people say Tim Curry. Down here we all flow. Thanks so much to Gary Smart of Dead Mouse Productions and Cult Screenings for sharing his journey with me right here on the Straight to Video podcast. It was great to learn how everything works, but just to hear how passionate Gary is about the horror genre shows why everything Dead Mouse release is always the very best in quality. And I urge you all to check out their previous projects at cultscreenings.co.uk. If you want to catch up on over 200 episodes of this podcast, they can all be found at stvpod.com, along with some music, videos, and merchandise. And if you're ever passing through the Midlands one weekend, please pop into the straight-to-video 80s video shop in Alfreton, Derbyshire, to visit our recreation of an old-school video shop right here in 2022. We've got some exclusive merch only available at the shop, and you can immerse yourself in all things 80s. Chris and I have some great events coming up, particularly near to Halloween, so keep an eye on at 80s Video Shop all over social media and hope you can visit soon. That is all for this episode of the show. Again, as always, thanks for listening and I look forward to speaking to you all again very soon. <laughs>